Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, thanks for coming out on what's a rainy Friday afternoon here in Trinidad to have uh, a, a conversation and, and a learning experience around, again, what, what I describe as a collective global trauma with COVID-19. We're, we're close to a year and nine months into the pandemic. And, you know, every now and again, I like, still keep reflecting on you know, where we were six months ago, 12 months ago, at the beginning of the pandemic, and how things are evolving so rapidly, even when we were in the planning process for this, uh, for this session. Between the time we, we uh, suggested it as, as a topic, and today, so many things changed in that short period of time. So, you know, with everything there is now with vaccine rollout, so just, just some quick numbers, based on yesterday's um, update from the Ministry of Health, but 450,000 Trinidadians, I think, are fully vaccinated now. Uh, mostly Sinopharm with uh, some Pfizer and uh, uh, so yeah. Pfizer and AstraZeneca and Johnson Johnson still in there. Um, but we're still seeing plus cases a day. We're still seeing similar deaths, thankfully. We're still seeing more or less of the use, but it's just crumbling along, right? So, one of the things we sort of need to get our heads around, especially as locations are asking us these questions, you know, they're hearing about being for boosters, they're hearing about they can't travel to this place and that place if they get X, Y, and Y vaccine, and which is the best vaccine, but that question is still, you know, floating about. And then, you know, you, we totally vaccine was no, because look, you have to get boosters now. So I think now is a really, really good time to, to make sure we're up to date, and we're very privileged to have uh, Dr. Chris Merrins uh, to, to speak to us from, from Washington or Washington State, which was hit early and hard from COVID. And, you know, they, they, they led the way and taught us all a lot of lessons as to how to manage uh, with, with, with treatment, how to manage with vaccinations. And all the lessons that they were quite privileged to, to learn firsthand from Dr. Merrins. So everyone, thank you for coming again on Dr. Merrins. Uh, the floor is open to you. Thanks so much. Dr. Barnes, I believe you're muted. Sorry, I thought all of you could uh, lip read, but um, fair enough. I'll uh, put on the audio. Yeah, thanks again. It's really nice to see some familiar faces and to um, rejoin the uh, Trinidad community. Um, I have some slides that I will share. Um, hopefully they'll be useful. I definitely um, anticipate leaving some time for uh, questions and discussions. So hopefully we can address the, the issues that you know, are really also on, on your minds about this. So um, let me see, let's see, there we go. Just the usual acknowledgements and credits to our uh, funders. I have no conflicts of interest for this. Uh, essentially, I'm going to review some um, data regarding the efficacy of the various vaccines, uh, also talk about the new variants, and um, discuss some safety concerns regarding the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. Um, and I've got a little bit of information about the Sinopharm vaccine as well. So let's talk about the variants first, and just so we're all on the same page, so to speak. Um, right now, I, I would say there are there have been four major variants that um, the world has been very much concerned with, and this, these are their latest names. Uh, they're, they no longer have these confusing number and letter combinations that look like an IP address. Instead, we've shifted to giving them um, uh, Greek letters. So uh, Alpha was the one that emerged from Great Britain. Um, Beta emerged in South Africa around the same time. Uh, interestingly, they, they evolved, all these variants evolved independently, um, but share some common mutations. It's kind of an interesting example of convergent evolution. Uh, gamma from Brazil and uh, of course Delta is the major player across uh, the world today, uh, emerged out of uh, India this past June. Uh, and wherever these variants emerge, um, what really tends to distinguish them is how quickly they seem to um, take over uh, and emerge as the dominant strain. In South Africa, what's also interesting about it is uh, not only did it 
basically uh, take over the uh, local prevalence very rapidly, but it emerged in the Eastern Cape region, um, which is probably not coincidentally an area where there is a relatively low proportion of um, uh, people with HIV on treatment. So essentially this is a region of South Africa where you have a lot of people with immunosuppression. And this plus um, some other uh, fairly convincing data suggests that these variants may very well be evolving in selectively in persons who have immune, immune compromised uh, states, whether it's from uh, being on uh, medications that suppress their immune system or advanced HIV disease, uh, that immune suppressed state allows the COVID virus to replicate uh, multiple, multiple cycles um, rather than getting cleared by the body. And with those multiple cycles of replication, uh, the mutations accrue that then can spread out into the community. So it's, it's really kind of a strong argument for prioritizing the immunization of people with HIV as well as uh, some others with um, immune compromise. Um, the, what distinguishes these variants from one another are mutations in the spike protein. The spike uh, is the uh, club-shaped protein that is shown in this close-up of the virus, uh, the virus being on top, the uh, spike being the gray with the blue um, uh, glucose molecules attached to it. And this spike protein uh, binds to the ACE2 receptor shown at the bottom of this figure on the surface of epithelial cells. And uh, what happens with these variants is the virus manages to accumulate new mutations within the spike protein that typically allow for uh, better binding to that ACE2 receptor uh, there on the bottom. And so this is a sort of a molecular image on the left of what that spike protein looks like uh, with the various amino acid chains and figures. And on the right, you see uh, the various um, variants of concern uh, that are circulating out there and where the specific mutations are occurring, um, sort of shown on a, a stretched out genome. Uh, and then on the left, you can see uh, visually where on the actual spike protein itself those mutations are occurring. And not surprisingly, most of the mutations are occurring in either the RBD or the NTD domains. These are the areas that uh, come into close contact with the receptor uh, binding. This is kind of a simplified uh, version describing what some of those key mutations are in the different variants that we're working with. So uh, for example, uh, K K417N or T, uh, you'll notice that these mutations, uh, the, the lingo we use is exactly the same as we use for HIV resistance mutations, where, uh, wherein the first letter uh, indicates the uh, amino acid that is ordinarily or, uh, coded for at a certain codon position uh, in the spike gene. Um, domain. The number, of course, is the, the codon number, and then it's that uh, naturally occurring amino acid is replaced by the one shown in blue. So as you can see, many of these uh, strains share uh, common mutations, but they're not all universally the same. However, the ultimate effect of whatever mutations we see, again, tends to be uh, ones that allow for um, more efficient and stronger binding of the virus to that ACE2 receptor, and that re <clears throat> results in increased infectivity to others uh, and uh, increased difficulty for the body uh, to clear it. Um, they've managed to even sort of tease out exactly how these mutations might um, allow this. This is sort of a close-up of where the virus uh, on here on the bottom uh, binds to the receptor uh, there on the top and how a, sing a single amino, amino acid uh, change from N to Y at codon number 501 results in far more binding sites that allows it to bind um, more efficiently. So um, 
I think though we are more interested in what are the clinical implications um, and uh, what happens as a consequence of these mutations among the various uh, uh, variants. And so here, these are the four major variants of concern that we've been kind of dealing with globally uh, over the past year or so. Um, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Uh, delta being the most recent one that emerged uh, out of India roughly in June, and it's now become by far the most dominant global strain um, because primarily because it's so much more uh, infectious than the ancestral strains and uh, even also than the other variants of concern. It's estimated to be about twice as contagious um, as uh, the ancestral strains. Um, now, vaccines, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about the effect of the vaccines. They're mostly still effective, but there are some uh, caveats there. Um, and like many of these variants, it's pretty clear that this can fairly easily reinfect people who have already had COVID. So this is an important thing to know and to counsel our uh, patients about is, even if you've had COVID, you're really not protected against um, Delta or many of these other variants. Whereas the immunization provides much better protection than does natural uh, infection. Um, wherever the Delta variant has landed, it has tended to uh, very quickly displace the other variants and become the dominant circulating variant. So this is the experience in the United States where uh, it's pretty much all Delta. Um, these various shades of um, you know, brown uh, are, uh, simply uh, different minor variations of the Delta variant, um, but it's pretty much all Delta here as it is in many parts of the world. And we can talk about uh, what it is in uh, Trinidad. Um, my hunch is that it's probably most, if not virtually all Delta by now uh, there as well. Um, now, uh, I must say this slide is already a little bit outdated because it says that it's unknown if the Delta variant causes more disease. Uh, well, actually we do have data uh, that came out of the United Kingdom so that fairly convincingly suggests um, the Delta variant is about twice as likely as compared with the Alpha variant uh, to result in hospitalization. Um, so it does appear to cause more severe disease. Um, now, the, we don't have clear data yet on whether it is, causes higher rates of death. Uh, however, I would be surprised if it didn't, didn't frankly, because if it's uh, bad enough to be twice as likely to land you in the hospital, it's probably um, more likely than not to cause an increased risk of death uh, as well. And that's twice as likely as compared with the alpha variant, which was essentially the variant that preceded Delta in the United Kingdom. So wherever um, Delta has landed, as I mentioned, it has uh, tended to not only displace the other variants that were there, uh, on, on this chart on the right, the Delta variant is represented uh, in a green, and you see how it very quickly takes over as the dominant strain. Um, but not surprisingly, you also see a very steep rise in new infections wherever it lands, uh, at least initially, again, owing to the fact that it's at least twice as infectious uh, as other strains. And it's thought that, um, you know, they found that the, the viral loads of uh, the COVID virus um, in the mucosa of people who have it are up to like a thousand times higher than that seen with prior variants. So you just have a tremendously higher amount of shedding that's going on in individuals who are infected with Delta as compared with the prior strains. Uh, unfortunately, what uh, also typically follows the um, uh, increased uh, transmission of Delta and increased rates are increased rates of death uh, as well. Um, and you actually don't even necessarily need increased um, uh, severity of the variant to cause increased rates of death. Just having more cases will do that. But again, there's this all likelihood that the increased severity of disease associated with Delta is also leading to increased risk of death as well. And it certainly has been seen uh, in these countries 
although we'll talk about an interesting exception a little bit later on. Now, um, Delta, again, the big player out there right now in terms of the variant of uh, concern, but there are a couple others that are out there that you may have heard about. These are what are called variants of interest by the World Health Organization. They're essentially ones we're keeping a close eye on that have emerged but have not necessarily caused a whole lot of problems yet. Um, historically, the IOTA, ETA, Kappa, Epsilon variants, uh, these have emerged independently in various places. Again, uh, often sharing some, but not necessarily all of the same mutations. Uh, all examples of this sort of separately evolving convergent evolution of the virus. Um, what you may have been hearing more about lately is the Lambda variant, for example. Um, this emerged in uh, Peru and uh, it is fairly concentrated um, uh, globally uh, in the Americas. Um, there's even been like uh, 10 cases uh, documented in, in St. Kitts and Nevis. So clearly it's present in the uh, Caribbean region. Um, and there's definitely concern about it because simply looking at the pattern of mutations in the spike protein, uh, this would suggest that it would be about twice as in, uh, contagious as prior strains. Um, having said that, it doesn't appear to be uh, behaving the way Delta did in that its prevalence seems to actually be fading rather than increasing. Um, and uh, why that is, nobody can really, really say. Um, but uh, Peru has stopped having new cases and the uh, instances of the Lambda variant around the world seem to have been declining since last month. Uh, it also looks, uh, at least based on some preliminary data in one of these um, uh, BioRx uh, papers that haven't been peer reviewed, uh, it looks like the vaccines, at least the messenger RNA vaccine by Pfizer and Moderna are likely to work just fine against this variant. So probably not a huge problem given that it's going away and some of our key vaccines appear to work just as well. Um, the mu variant, um, uh, we know a little bit less about, but I would say there's a little bit more uh, area of concern here. Uh, this one was first identified in Colombia. Uh, it has spread um, uh, globally um, uh, beyond just the Americas. Uh, it's still a pretty small percentage of cases uh, globally, although in Colombia and Ecuador, it's a fairly high percentage and seems to be rising in some countries in South America, but it doesn't seem to be quite as contagious as Delta. It has a, a whole lot of uh, key mutations. And I think what has people most worried is what's kind of shown in that uh, graph on the right, um, which is that uh, prior infection and vaccination seem to offer less protection against this variant as compared with the other ones we've seen uh, so far, including Delta. Um, so the, the concern is, you know, maybe the virus is starting to get just the right set of mutations that is gonna allow it to really evade um, uh, uh, vaccination. Having said that, this, um, these are neutralization antibody titers. Um, and it's a bit theoretical because we know that the uh, ability of the immune system to control uh, COVID and to prevent infection depends on much more than just the um, antibody response. The T cell response is also critically important. And that T cell response has not been measured uh, uh, against mu in response to vaccination or prior infection. Um, so this is why it's a variant of concern, uh, why people are keeping an eye on it. But uh, again, it hasn't seemed to broken out and caused a huge problem the way Delta has. Um, all right, so uh, let's transition to <clears throat> vaccines at this point. This is a, a dashboard that I've uh, tried to sort of construct, um, taking all the um, the major vaccines out there, I'll talk about Sinopharm uh, a little bit later, but basically the Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, and the Novavax vaccine. Um, the Novavax vaccine is um, 
by the way, is not in uh, use anywhere just yet, but it very likely will be soon. And it looks like a very good vaccine, which is why I included it uh, in this table. Um, and what I've tried to summarize in this table is <clears throat> just how uh, protective um, these vaccines seem to be according to um, degree of uh, illness, starting with, you know, on the left, asymptomatic infection, you know, actually not bad for a vaccine, um, and then progressing through various stages of severity, looking at any symptomatic illness, severe disease, hospitalization, uh, or death. And I think what really stands out is what I've uh, outlined here in the red box, is just how phenomenally effective uh, all of these vaccines are in preventing severe disease, hospitalization, or, or death. Uh, at the start of this pandemic, which yeah, it does seem like ages ago, um, no one would have expected that we would have this many vaccines that work this well at preventing severe disease. I mean, this is just kind of an astounding uh, accomplishment um, that uh, we've been able uh, to do this. So as the box shows, <clears throat> I mean, nothing really is 100%. Clinical trials um, are often showing 100% uh, effectiveness in preventing severe disease, hospitalization, or death. Real world data, of course, there are some, uh, some people that sort of slip through the cracks, so to speak. Um, so the real world, world data are still nevertheless consistently uh, in the high 90s. Um, and uh, I just think that's something we need to be uh, communicating very strongly and forcefully to our patients that, okay, the, maybe this vaccine isn't 100% effective in preventing the illness, but it will keep you out of the hospital. It'll keep you from dying. Um, and that just really needs to be stressed uh, as much as we can. Um, now, what, what about the variants though? Has that sort of upset the apple cart, so to speak, uh, in terms of the effectiveness of these uh, vaccines? Um, well, here in this table, I've tried to summarize uh, how well they work, uh, how well these different vaccines work against the different uh, variants. And, um, and I think, of course, the really important one to be looking at here is how well do they work against the Delta variant? Because this is the one that uh, we're pretty much all confronting uh, nowadays. And um, as we've seen against the other variants, really it's the uh, messenger RNA-based vaccines that seem to perform the best, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Um, again, this is against all COVID illness, any kind of illness. Um, basically, we're, we're looking at probably the high 80s uh, to 90% um, uh, effectiveness in preventing illness um, against Delta by the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. So still really quite good. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, this is kind of a pattern we've seen with other variants as well, Not doesn't perform quite as well as the messenger RNA vaccines uh, with a 60% um, efficacy in preventing any COVID illness. But um, it's worth looking at that um, just below it, 92% uh, against effective in preventing hospitalization. So um, the AstraZeneca vaccine may not be quite as potent uh, against Delta, but it's still gonna be uh, very effective in keeping you out of the hospital and keeping you uh, from, di from dying. We simply don't have enough data yet regarding the performance of the Johnson & Johnson or the Novavax vaccine against the Delta variant uh, to make much of a statement there. Uh, what we have discovered um, is that with both the messenger RNA and the AstraZeneca vaccines though, is you really need both doses to get meaningful protection against the Delta uh, variant. Um, we, we've seen very little in the way of neutralizing antibody response after just one dose of either of these. So uh, very important to get both of the vaccines. And this is in contrast to uh, other variants in which, frankly, you, you, uh, we would see a pretty significant benefit from just one dose uh, with the second dose kind of providing, I don't know, a bit additional or mop-up protection. With Delta, it's a bit different. You really do need both doses to get good protection. 
And uh, as I mentioned, the AstraZeneca does very well in terms of preventing hospitalization. Um, again, though, you, you really do need both doses because after just one dose, it's only 33% uh, protection against COVID illness. Um, now, I wanted to come back and show something interesting that uh, happened with the Delta experience in the United Kingdom versus South Africa. So on the top line, we have the experience of South Africa uh, in terms of cases on the left and uh, deaths from COVID on the right. And as you can see, the and not surprisingly, those uh, uh, epidemiology curves uh, pretty much overlap and mirror one another. Not quite as many deaths um, as cases, but that's really uh, to be expected. Um, however, in the UK, um, and that's the South Africa as shown in the circles up above, high rise in cases on the left, you see a corresponding uh, significant rise in deaths uh, on the right. Um, in the UK, by contrast, you had a similar spike in cases from Delta uh, in July um, uh, or June, I should say. But then uh, extending out, you did not see um, really much of a budge at all in death from it. And the key difference between the United Kingdom and South Africa was uh, the level of vaccination. Um, in the UK, they had pretty high rates of vaccination by then, uh, almost exclusively with the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. And what accounts for this disparity is that uh, individuals in the UK who had received the AstraZeneca vaccine were uh, in fact getting um, uh, COVID, but they were having very mild cases of it and they weren't dying for it. And that's why they're, the, you know, the death curve remained uh, flat on the right side of the screen there. So it's a real testament to just how well uh, vaccines, even if you know imperfect, like the AstraZeneca, uh, can make a huge impact in uh, preventing uh, widespread mortality. Um, and it's it's been clearly documented that um, uh, you know in in other situations, this was a, a very nice study uh, done of uh, healthcare workers in India uh, that clearly showed that you know having had the AstraZeneca vaccine does not protect you. Um, from necessarily from getting um, the, the Delta variant, uh, either symptomatically or asymptomatically. Now, it did reduce the chance of getting it and uh, it dramatically reduced the risk of getting severe infection. But uh, clearly, um, uh, patients and healthcare workers who have received the AstraZeneca vaccine are getting breakthrough infections. Um, and not that we really shouldn't be piling on AstraZeneca uh, either because we're seeing the same phenomenon um, with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. Um, individuals who have received both vaccines of Pfizer or Moderna fully vaccinated, we are seeing more and more breakthrough uh, infections. Again, they're almost always very mild illness, um, but it's the kind of finding that uh, has actually led to uh, quite a bit of thinking here and um, frankly, probably likely to happen soon, um, that booster shots uh, are going to be recommended, um, I, I suspect, uh, for individuals here in the United States, um, uh, a third shot of either the Pfizer or the Moderna shot uh, will likely be recommended just to try and sort of boost that immunity. Um, and the, the data supporting that approach primarily actually comes from Israel. Um, Israel uh, got uh, pretty pretty out in front of the epidemic with um, a, a very high vaccination rate of the population with the Pfizer vaccine early on. And they have uh, very clearly documented um, breakthrough cases um, and surges in the virus due to breakthrough infections. Again, not severe illness, but enough that they are um, favoring uh, booster shots uh, as well, especially among older individuals. Um, now, I promised I'd mention the Sinopharm vaccine um, because uh, uh, from what I understand, uh, Trinidad has received uh, quite a bit of this and has been using it uh, as well. Um, and I must say it's been, it was difficult to find much information about this. Um, it's the, uh, the efficacy data that I uh, quote in this slide really comes from the company. Uh, 
um, uh, say, saying based on, well, their interpretation of their own data that um, out of this phase three trial, uh, it was 79% effective in, in terms of preventing symptomatic um, COVID and uh, efficacy in preventing hospitalization was also 79%, which seems a little odd to me. Uh, I would think the efficacy against hospitalization would be higher. Um, however, it did have a much broader confidence interval. So I think as, um, as we get more data, uh, this will likely get narrowed down a bit and be better defined. Um, now, there is some corroborating um, uh, sort of observational data from uh, Bahrain uh, in the Middle East. Apparently, they uh, were using the Sinopharm vaccine as well. Um, and uh, their data suggests 80% uh, efficacy in preventing symptomatic uh, COVID illness. So um, I think um, for, you know, as much to the degree that we can you know, trust the data we've seen without seeing the, you know, actual papers and the peer-reviewed journal, it does look like a very effective uh, vaccine. Um, now, a few caveats, uh, the, the trial upon which these data are based was not designed nor powered to demonstrate efficacy against severe disease, persons with uh, comorbidities, pregnant, or persons aged 60 years and above. It was kind of a, you know, almost a, an ideal younger uh, population in whom it was studied. Uh, women were underrepresented and um, no people with HIV were included in these trials uh, either. Um, there are other efficacy trials underway. We don't have data yet. Um, and we really don't know um, what <clears throat> to what degree this vaccine interrupts uh, asymptomatic infection and ongoing transmission of the virus. Um, furthermore, we don't really know how well it behaves with respect to uh, different variants out there, especially the, the uh, Delta variant. So lots of questions that kind of um, remain to be answered, but the preliminary data suggests that it's actually a, uh, not a bad uh, vaccine. Um, there is some concern uh, that it doesn't work as well in the elderly. This is from a, a different paper that it's only a, a preprint, hasn't been peer reviewed yet, but just based on um, neutralizing antibody production, it would, it would appear that um, uh, increasing age uh, uh, significantly reduces the antibody uh, titers um, seen in recipients of this vaccine uh, to levels where it's questionable whether they would have an effective uh, immunity against it. Now, again, a couple big caveats here. Neutralizing antibody is not everything. Uh, there's also T cell immune mediated immunity. And furthermore, this is just a recently uh, posted preprint um, uh, that has not yet been peer reviewed. Um, so, this is a, um, uh, a, a diagram that I sort of stumbled across uh, generated by a, um, uh, a scientist who's really been trying to track these various vaccines. And uh, she tried to put all the key vaccines on a single graph that, um, you know, placing them according to uh, safety and tolerability uh, versus efficacy. So looking at the way those axes run, uh, your best vaccines are going to occupy that upper left corner uh, or quadrant of the um, uh, of the graph. There, unfortunately, there are <laughs> no vaccines that perfectly occupy that. But um, I think when you you look at the really uh, the highest efficacy ones, not surprisingly, the Pfizer and the Moderna, uh, they score the highest in terms of efficacy. Uh, the Pfizer seems to be a little bit better tolerated than Moderna in terms of uh, side effects. But again, these side effects are generally uh, really not that bad. Um, uh, people who receive these vaccines, a, a sore arm is common. Sometimes they feel a bit fluish for the next day or two, um, but it's pretty much limited to that. There are, are some case reports of myocarditis uh, and those are being tracked too, but um, exceedingly rare uh, uh, complication. Um, then looking at some of the other vaccines out there, um, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, not quite as effective, um, definitely has its issues with side effects. Um, 
And then the, the, the Novavax, I think, uh, again, preliminary data suggests it really holds a lot of promise. I mean, look at where it falls on this chart. It's almost as effective as the messenger RNA vaccines, but uh, better tolerated. So that could bode very well. The Sinopharm Beijing is the sort of second generation of the Sinopharm vaccine. And that, again, from the data we have, it looks pretty good, um, very well tolerated. and. Uh, roughly 80% uh, efficacy, uh, although the data are rather preliminary. All right, um, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, some safety concerns that you've probably heard about, and I think it's worth getting some clarity about. Um, this first sort of started hitting the, hitting the news uh, a couple of months ago that um, Recipients of this uh, AstraZeneca vaccine were developing uh, these, this unusual situation of blood clots and low blood platelets. And uh, specifically, um, we were seeing cases of what, what's called cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. Uh, these are blood clots in the uh, basically these large veins that drain from the brain. And blood clots in this area can be particularly uh, bad because, of course, the brain is um, uh, enclosed within the rigid skull and there's just uh, no room uh, to allow for the swelling that typically occurs with a blood clot in that area. So one can get um, uh, very easily, one can get strokes and uh, severe brain damage from a blood clot in this region. Um, the other area where the blood clots were being seen was in the splanchnic veins, the splanchnic circulation uh, services, basically uh, the GI tract and the uh, organs that uh, support that. And so the key symptoms um, and signs that one should be on the watch for in patients who receive the AstraZeneca vaccine are uh, basically those symptoms of either a uh, cerebral venous thrombosis, so things like headache, blurred vision, um, or uh, a blood clot in the splanchnic circulation that um, could then break off and go to the lungs or could occur um, as a deep venous thrombosis in the lower leg. So shortness of breath, chest pain, leg swelling, um, persistent uh, stomach pain. And with these blood clots, we often see uh, very low platelet counts, which uh, uh, predisposes to paradoxically bruising. So you get this odd pattern of both uh, excess clotting and excess bleeding in different parts of the body. Um, we've worked out the pathophysiology and it's actually uh, uh, very similar, virtually identical to a known complication that can be seen uh, with uh, heparin, um, and which is called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia with thrombosis. Um, and it's a particularly difficult one uh, to manage because again, um, the, the, the consequence of this fairly complicated cascade of events is that you have uh, immune system mediated uh, bleeding and uh, uh, coagulation at abnormal levels. And um, so, you know, it's hard to sort of treat these two opposite ends of the spectrum simultaneously. Um, uh, there, are an, there are treatments for it and it involves primarily um, immunoglobulin, IgG. Uh, if you have it, uh, platelet factor four, uh, uh, antibodies can also be helpful. Um, and uh, in association with the receipt of the vaccine, it's been called VITT, vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia with thrombosis. Um, and uh, or in other places, it's been called vaccine-induced prothrombotic immune thrombocytopenia or VIPIT. Um, the incidence uh, appears to be about one in 100,000 based on um, the best data we have that came from Germany. Um, uh, and it would appear that it's more common in women and uh, especially in women who um, uh, are, are younger. And so um, given that younger women are at less risk of severe COVID illness, um, it's actually been recommended in many countries to not give the AstraZeneca vaccine to women under 30 years uh, of age. Um, and I think this 
this sort of exercise done by someone to uh, examine, try to really calculate the risk benefit, it kind of nicely summarizes the benefits versus harm of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, the benefits um, versus harms more or less evenly balance out um, at 30 years and below. Uh, but above that, you you know the, the, the risk of this complication uh, gradually diminishes, whereas the, um, the benefits of preventing COVID uh, get larger and larger. So um, this is the logic behind the guidance that we've seen in some countries to not use the AstraZeneca vaccine individuals uh, and women under 30 years of age or even on uh, anyone under 30 years of age. So I'll just uh, conclude with the, uh, one of the real problems that's at least um, bedeviling us in the United States, which is misinformation on social media. It's, it's been a, a very big impediment to getting people vaccinated. Um, so uh, hopefully you're not having quite the same problem um, in the Caribbean region, but I'd like to open it up to discussion around that and other issues at this point. Okay, thank you, Dr. Barron. Um, excellent as usual. So I just want to encourage anyone, if you have any questions, you can unmute uh, and ask your question, raise your hand as well if you want to be called upon. Uh, if you can't unmute to where you are, feel free, please, to type your question in the chat box. So while we're sort of waiting up, oh, Dr. Musa, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Barron, misinformation is actually, is, I think it's almost a human thing because, for example, a number of people I come across who are against the vaccine are waiting. But when you ask them what they're waiting for, they actually have no idea what they're waiting for. And this might be laughable, but the misinformation that Bill Gates wants to kill half the world and most of the people vaccinated are going to die in the next three years and the vaccine is a chip and so on. It's very common and then there is a lot of there are lots and lots of things people are downloading from YouTube and internet and sending to others. However, what is the time frame from the time somebody gets AstraZeneca vaccine to the time when you most expect them to develop a blood clot? Oh yeah, very good question. It's, uh, it typically happens very quickly, like within a week or two. Um, I, I think I recall the, the mean time was like five to eight days, something like that. So this is something that occurs relatively soon. Hi, Dr. Behrens, a question in the chat box. Should we also be concerned with clotting with the Johnson Johnson vaccine? Uh, yeah, good question, because you're, you're, you're right. It has been reported with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but not as frequently as with the um, AstraZeneca. And it, so I, and, and I, I, um, I believe the incidence was more like one in a million, uh, whereas with AstraZeneca is more like one in 100,000. Um, and that one in one million, um, and we're talking about, you know, again, these specific kind of blood clot issue with thrombocytopenia, that does actually exceed the background rate, um, which is why um, it, it was decided to say that, you know, this, this should be considered a possible side effect, albeit an extremely rare one. Hi, Dr. Barron. I was wondering, as persons try to start moving around the world again, as the world opens back up, is there going to be such a thing as over-vaccination or problems that persons have taking three or four of the different types of vaccines? Right. Yeah, that's also a very good question. Um, there, personally, I wouldn't mind trying to collect all of them, you know, like collecting stamps or something. Uh, um, but there, um, there are some interesting studies underway looking at what are called mix and match or heter, um, uh, heter hetero vaccination approaches, uh, wherein let's say the first vaccine was AstraZeneca and then uh, one receives, um, say, the, the Pfizer vaccine. 
Um, and the preliminary data from those trials actually look pretty good, um, that uh, it works well and it seems to be safe. And um, so uh, this idea of, you know, you, maybe you don't have to get the exact same vaccine um, for your, your second shot as you did for the first shot, for example, especially relevant for people who got AstraZeneca, which, uh, and now something like Pfizer is available. We know Pfizer is a bit more effective, especially against Delta. So, you know, personally, that's what I would want to do. And um, it's looking like that's a solid strategy, although I've not seen it, you know, I, I don't think it's quite ready for prime time, so to speak. I think there's a separate question uh, about, you know, boosters. And I think the evidence is accumulating that even with, you know, our most potent vaccines, the messenger RNA vaccines, um, the immunity does seem to wane and we are seeing breakthrough infections. There's no question about that. And the data from Israel suggests that uh, receiving a third shot of the messenger RNA vaccine, whether it be in Israel's case, it was all Pfizer, uh, provides a very strong boost to immunity. Um, and uh, uh, very likely provides very strong protection going forward. Um, so I do think we're going to see, um, you know, uh, the more and more issues around the use of, of boosters. Now, there are people who have argued quite logically, I think, um, uh, here in the United States against prioritizing booster shots, um, given that even those people who do get breakthrough infections are all getting, almost all of them are getting mild infections. And I think they very reasonably point out that, you know, all these booster shots would be better served in the arms of people around the world um, so we can protect others from getting severe disease. So we can reduce the risk of more variants um, uh, evolving, et, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's a very valid criticism. Um, so uh, I'm not sure exactly how it's going to play out here in the United States. The FDA is actually meeting today uh, to uh, discuss. I don't know if they'll decide today whether to endorse this whole booster shot uh, phenomenon. Um, but that's um, I, I, I have a hunch that we will end up doing that here in the United States. And I suspect other countries will follow Israel's lead and uh, start using boosters as well, uh, assuming they have the supply. Um, I, I, I think a related question is, you know, as we see more variants emerge, is there the possibility of seeing a variant come out that combines the worst of like, let's say the, the high infectivity of Delta plus the immune escape that we suspect may be associated with the mu um, version, such that we really do need uh, a, a sort of new and, new and improved vaccine altogether. And I think that could happen too. Um, fortunately, the, the technology involved in the messenger RNA vaccines is such that it's, um, my understanding is it's not all that difficult to generate a new vaccine that is sort of custom tailored to um, a new variant, for example. It's almost like updating software uh, because we know exactly what the mutations are. We re-engineer the messenger RNA and the, the vaccine, um, and uh, hopefully it won't be all that complicated and won't take you know, a full year to develop a um, sort of new and improved booster to address new variants. But that's, that's kind of speculative and perhaps wishful thinking. Dr. Burns, there's a question in the chat box. Which of the four vaccines available in Trinidad and Tobago would you recommend for someone with a list of comorbidities, example, stroke, heart attack, diabetes, et cetera? Uh, well, wh which four exactly are available right now? That would be Sinopharm, AstraZeneca, Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson. Okay, I would recommend the Pfizer um, because primarily because it's the most potent and um, and it's it's really quite safe. Um, we're not seeing problems with blood clots with the Pfizer. Um, the we're seeing very rare cases of myocarditis, and that's about it. 
Um, so given, I think the Pfizer right now has the best combination of, of all of our options really in terms of that efficacy and safety. At MRF, we currently we have Sinopharm and Johnson. Our patients, well, are all HIV infected, a few with comorbidities, and sometimes they would ask you, which one do you recommend? <laughs> so between those two, which one is a, bet, is a slightly safer bet than the other one? Uh, that, that's tough because, um, well, I, I guess, first of all, I would say they both look like they're very good options. Um, so it's kind of a nice problem to have, uh, trying to decide between two very good options. Um, I guess if it were me or a patient I was caring for, I might go for the Johnson & Johnson just because I feel like there are more data out there um, that I can look at and evaluate and it's been out there longer, the, the, the Sinopharm, I mean, I feel like we're just relying on um, data secondhand. Um, and it's just, uh, that's why I'm a little, you know, uneasy on, on paper with the data we have so far is to just, if anything, the Sinopharm may be better. Um, but I really would hesitate to fully endorse that until we get more, more data, uh, you know, ideally published in a peer reviewed journal. We have uh, Jacqueline Reed has a hand up to ask a question, and then we have a question in the chat box. Yes, good afternoon. I hope you're hearing me well. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, good. Doctor, doctor, I said Dr. Um, Behrens. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I, I, I looked at um, some of the, I'm concerned in a couple of ways. I know usually when we have vaccines for various things like polio, et cetera, it's a, it's a set vaccine that's given, let's say, throughout the world to various persons, I think. But I've noticed, in fact, that the various things that we are calling vaccines for, um, for COVID are different with, with every one of the firms. The formulation I'm talking about is different. And I've, I've heard some people call it a booster rather than a vaccine. And I'm wondering, is it really a booster more than a vaccine in itself because of the different formula? formulas that are being used to, um, to deal with this particular COVID? Sure. Okay. So yeah, I, th I think it's a kind of a terminology question and yeah, it, it can all get rather confusing. Um, uh, booster specifically refers to someone who has completed the initial vaccination or vaccination series. And then uh, a certain time later, typically at least a year or more, um, a, a, another vaccination of the same thing or very similar is recommended just in order to give a bit of a boost to the immune system. So for example, when we're infants, you know, when we're real little, we usually complete a series of vaccinations against tetanus and, um, and diphtheria. But later in life, every 10 years or so, we're supposed to get a tetanus booster to just make sure we maintain that uh, immunity to tetanus. So initial uh, vaccine, uh, whether it's one or two doses, that's the, that's the vaccination, the primary vaccination. And then the booster is, you know, the subsequent one, typically at least a year later, uh, just to um, restore the, the uh, waning immunity and make sure um, the immune system is maintained its strength. Um, now, you're, you also make a point about how, um, you know, there's all these different uh, mechanisms that were used to create these vaccines. Uh, let me see if I can find, yeah, though here, here's an example. And, uh, and it's true, what's uh, been interesting about the COVID vaccine as compared with most other, um, you know, uh, contagious infectious diseases to date that we prevent with vaccines is the wide variety of uh, technologies and approaches used in these different uh, vaccines. And I think it reflects uh, basically two trends. One is advances in technology um, that have afforded us entirely new uh, ways 
to try and create vaccines in the first place. So for example, this messenger RNA uh, technology is brand new. It had never been used before uh, to create a vaccine. And it looked good on paper, but nobody was really sure if it would actually work. Um, and in fact, it did work and it's worked spectacularly well. Um, and so I have a feeling we're gonna see a lot more vaccines in the future that are based on this same uh, kind of technology. Um, the adenovirus, um, DNA vaccines, that's um, uh, an older technology. And then of course, protein plus adjuvant, and even older technology. Um, and uh, so the other trend uh, that was responsible for this wide variety of vaccine types uh, was that this was a really alarming um, and dangerous pandemic um, to which multiple uh, countries and uh, governments and independent um, uh, biopharmaceutical firms uh, stepped up and said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna try and come up with something uh, in terms of a vaccine against this. And um, there were just a lot more resources and a lot more players out there um, ready to go on this. Uh, I would say, a lot of this um, actually, you know, a lot of the uh, priming of the whole vaccine pipeline, so to speak, occurred as a consequence of all the research that's been done on uh, HIV vaccines, which uh, has unfortunately failed to yield us a, an, a, a, you know, an effective HIV vaccine, but um, it did provide us, you know, all that background research, especially um, involving adenovirus-based DNA vaccines. Um, that was basically a platform upon which others built um, in terms of developing COVID vaccines. And those two ended up being very effective. So um, there's, you know, it's, uh, it's really uh, kind of a blessing. It was always felt that we need uh, a vaccine as soon as possible. And we're not gonna put all our eggs in one basket. Um, we need to have multiple governments, multiple options, multiple technologies pursued simultaneously, and hopefully, you know, one or two of those will pan out. Fortunately, many of them have panned out pretty much simultaneously. So uh, it's, it's a ter terrific result. But I, I hope that answered your question as to why we've got such a wide variety. A question in the chat box goes, if there's a need for booster shots, would it be best to get a booster of Pfizer, even if you've had Astra or Sinopharm, or should you just stick with your original vaccine? Well, um, my hunch is that you'll be best off getting Pfizer, um, but that approach is not quite ready for prime time. I don't think we've, I, the, I, I know there are some initial data that look rather promising in that regard. Um, and based how well, based on again on how good the Pfizer vaccine is, uh, to me the idea of you know combining one vaccine, another vaccine, it uh, seems like that would be the logical approach. But that that approach has not been you know um, given a full throat endorsement, as far as I know, by any government or regulatory agency. I wouldn't be surprised if that emerges, however, as a preferred approach. We have another question from Jacqueline Week. Go ahead, Jacqueline. Yes, um, one, one, last, one last question. Um, I remembered in the beginning when, when COVID was being treated, they, because it is also an RNA virus as HIV, they were using a lot of the HIV drugs as, that we are aware of. And, and I know that those didn't really work to any great extent. Um, I'm thinking even as they're making now a, an, an approach in terms of the RNA technology, would that also be, would that also be helpful in terms of dealing with HIV as well, considering the fact that to this date, HIV has not been cured, we have no vaccine for it, how could we be sure about this vaccine that's been done for COVID if it's along the same lines? Yeah, good question. So for example, uh, as I just mentioned, we, we have uh, consistently tried and failed to come up with an effective HIV vaccine to date, but could somehow this messenger RNA technology uh, offer 
a, uh, a way of developing an effective HIV vaccine um, where, where we failed in the past. Um, uh, I guess the short answer is I don't know. I just don't know enough about the uh, HIV vaccine world to be able to say whether this offers some sort of um, fundamental new insight and avenue or, uh, or not. Um, but uh, that's one area where I could see maybe uh, all the research into COVID and, and these efforts paying off. Um, I think it's less likely that we'll develop any new anti-HIV medications or treatments out of the, uh, the, the COVID uh, experience. Um, we have come up with, well, we found one antiviral that seems to work um, pretty well, a direct antiviral agent called remdesivir has some impact in advanced disease. Interestingly, that was a medication used, um, uh, fashioned initially to try and treat Ebola. Uh, it didn't work so well against Ebola, but it turns out to work, uh, have some efficacy against COVID. Um, so yeah, I think there's a potential that um, uh, we could see some spin-off benefit in terms of uh, at least an HIV vaccine. Is there a possibility, Dr. Barrens, that the mutations we are noticing on COVID-19 are as a result of natural progression of the virus? And if we were to monitor and try to study different viruses in different regions of the world, we might maybe find much more than just Delta. Two, any words or any light on the Cuban vaccine? Because there are few people I meet who are not willing to take any vaccine until maybe the Cuban one comes into Trinidad and Tobago. Hmm. Um, so I guess, first off, I, uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I really don't know anything about the Cuban vaccine. Um, uh, I haven't looked into that, um, just didn't really cross my radar. And, um, so I wish I could tell you more uh, about that. Um, in terms of, you know, finding other variants out there, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are other variants out there. Um, you know, this, this uh, COVID seems to mutate a bit more than I think anybody expected and in ways that we weren't anticipating uh, at, at the start. Um, the truth is it, it takes a fair amount of you know, technology and, and uh, effort and cost to sequence these viruses. Um, the United Kingdom does probably a better job than anyone um, in terms of just you know, randomly sampling and sequencing the viruses they see. Um, and so they're often the, some of the best data regarding variants and how they behave does come from the United Kingdom. Um, you know, I think in an ideal world, sure, we'd be globally, you know, maybe sequencing uh, every 10th case of COVID to see uh, what new mutations we're picking up and in an effort to try and be uh, ahead of the game. But uh, unfortunately, that's just not possible. And so we're more in a kind of a reactive rather than proactive position. Um, we notice something going on when we see sort of a sudden spike in cases in a certain area. That's how, for example, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the beta variant uh, from South Africa was picked up. It was, just, it was a nurse practitioner uh, who noticed a sudden spike in cases in the Eastern Cape region and thought, well, this is odd, um, and sent a sample up to the UK. And uh, similarly in England, the alpha variant, it was because somebody noticed a spike in cases in um, in Kent's uh, region and um, said, okay, something must be going on here. This is very odd. So we're reacting, you know, to, uh, uh, or at least we have today, mostly reacted against epidemiologic outbreaks um, rather than proactively identifying, um, you know, the, the sort of potentially frightening uh, variants. Um, Hopefully we'll get better at that uh, in, in the future. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Barons. And again, thanks everyone else for making this such an interactive and such a, a, a
rich conversation today. Uh, I, I hope everyone got the benefits of it. And I know there are a couple of unanswered questions, but I just want to be mindful and respectful of everyone's time. So again, uh, thanks everyone. Just a quick housekeeping note. Next week's session will be the final session for uh, HIV and mental health or ECHO series. It will be uh, this eighth session, self-care for clinic staff presented by again, Khatija Khan, who has been very you know, supportive and, 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 uh, and very generous with her time and expertise. Um, and she's a uh, lecturer in faculty of medical sciences and she's a clinical psychologist. So uh, again, everyone be safe, be well, and we shall see you next week for HIV and mental health. And the following week, if I'm not mistaken, on October the 1st, Dr. Brand will be with us again for another special invited uh, Friday session. And you just uh, keep an eye out for the notification on that session. So again, everyone be, be safe, have a wonderful weekend, and it's uh, goodbye from us at MRF HIV H S C I F O. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye.